Good morning, and welcome to the Atlantic Council for today's event on practicing 21st century diplomacy. It's great to be here today with all of you. My name is Matthew Kranig, and I'm the acting director of the Atlantic Council's Scowcroft Center for Strategy and Security. Today's event is timely, as the world is in a new, more contested era, marked by a return of great power rivalry, the emergence of the new technologies of the Fourth Industrial Revolution, and other developments. Meanwhile, Russia's invasion of Ukraine has unleashed Europe's worst war in decades. Uh, for the United States and its allies, navigating this new era requires effectively applying multiple instruments, including diplomacy. Uh, and in this new era, I think we've uh, seen that people have uh, focused on what does this mean uh, for, for military, uh, for uh, developments on the battlefield, but there's been less uh, sustained attention to what does this mean for the practice of diplomacy, uh, and that's uh, what the Atlanta Council's uh, work in this area has focused on, and that, that's the focus of today's event. Uh, so what are the practices, the tools, including technology, that dip diplomats must harness to capably exercise diplomacy in the 21st century? Uh, and given the importance of this topic, the Scowcroft Center published an issue brief earlier this year entitled 21st Century Diplomacy, Strengthening U.S. Diplomacy for the Challenges of Today and Tomorrow. This paper broadly sketched elements of 21st century diplomacy, including the need to get smart on technology, reinvigorate engagement with institutions, countries, and individuals, and advance partnerships with like-minded nations to lead in the digital age. Convenings on topics such as this are integral to the Scowcroft Center's mission of developing sustainable nonpartisan strategies to address the most important security challenges facing the United States and the world. Uh, the Center also honors General Brent Scowcroft's legacy of service and embodies his ethos of nonpartisan commitment to the cause of security, support for U.S. leadership and cooperation with allies and partners, and dedication to the mentorship of the next generation of leaders. Uh, I'd very much like to thank our speakers uh, today, Ambassador Derek Hogan, Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary of the State Department's Bureau of European and Eurasian Affairs. Um, and he'll speak uh, about his experience on 21st century diplomacy, uh, particularly amid a time of war in Europe. Thanks also to our moderator, CNN National Security Correspondent Kylie Atwood, and Dana Barnes, President of Global Government at Data Miner, for being here. We're delighted to partner with Data Miner, uh, our sponsor for this event. Uh, so we hope you enjoy today's conversation. We'll reserve some time for audience questions at the end. Uh, for those of you joining virtually, you can submit questions on Twitter using the hashtag, uh, hashtag 21CDiplomacy. Uh, for those here in person, Atlantic Council staff are standing on the side of the room with an iPad for submitting questions. Uh, please signal to them if you would like to submit a question. Uh, thank you all again, and now I'd like to turn to Dana Barnes, President of Global Government at Data Miner, for introductory remarks. Dana, welcome. Thank you, Matt. Thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. It's a beautiful day in Washington, D.C. For those of you who have actually come in person, you know that's probably not true. It's a little bit raining. But uh, my name is Dana Barnes, as Matt said. Uh, I'm the president of Global Public Sector for Data Miner. And on behalf of the Atlantic Council and Data Miner, uh, I am honored to be a part of today's conversation uh, with Mr. Hogan, the ambassador. Data Miner is one of the leading AI organizations uh, in the planet. Uh, our technology deliver delivers real-time alerting. It enables organizations to make informed decisions quickly, accurately, uh, to support their mission. We work with many enterprises and newsrooms uh, and global organizations and governments, including CNN and the U.S. Department of State. Data Miner is, a pro is proud to partner with the Atlantic Council on this topic of 21st century diplomacy. This is the third event that we are doing with the Atlantic Council on this topic. And if you'd like to learn more about some of the things that we've done, if you go to the Atlantic Council's website, there is a briefing that the Atlantic Council has done on 21st century diplomacy. It's fantastic. Highly recommended. Diplomacy has always been centered around quick and accurate collection of information. This event excuse me, uh, a country's ability to gain access to information and leverage it in pursuit of its strategic objectives continues to define successful diplomatic efforts. The advent of social media and the onslaught of disinformation has drastically impacted diplomacy. One could argue that agility in the information sphere is what defines the success of a country's diplomatic efforts. Publicly available information has leveled the playing field for many of the world's nation states uh, and even some of the bad actors that are out there because more information is available and accessible to them 
which in the past may have only been accessible uh, to large countries and nation states. Now it is truly the speed of access, verification, and ultimately engagement with both general public and other nation states that can have reverberating effects on the efficacy of diplomatic efforts. With all of that said, I would like to tell you about today's moderator, guests uh, Kylie Atwood of CNN and Ambassador Derek Hogan. Mrs. Atwood has worked in the news industry for over 10 years, joining CNN in 2017 as a national security correspondent. And in January of 2020, she was included in Crane's News Pro 12 to Watch in TV News. Prior to CNN, Kylie spent six years at CBS News as a State Department reporter and was Bob Schiffer's assistant and researcher. Ms. Atwood graduated cum laude from Middlebury College with a major in international studies and a minor in economics. Ambassador Derek Hogan currently serves as Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary in the Bureau of European and Eurasian Affairs. Prior, he served as Ambassador to U.S. Embassy Moldova and as Deputy Executive Secretary of the U.S. Department of State. He previously served as a U.S. Department of State representative on two civilian military provi uh, provincial reconstruction teams in southern and eastern Afghanistan. Mr. Hogan's other overseas assignments include Russia, Belarus, Nicaragua, and the Dominican Republic. In Washington, Mr. Hogan served as Special Assistant to Secretary of State Colin Powell and a watch officer in the State Department's Operations Center. Mr. Hogan has a bachelor's degree from the University of Pittsburgh and a master's degree in public affairs from the, public, from the School of Public and International Affairs at Princeton University. Please join me in welcoming Ms. Kylie Atwood and Ambassador Derek Hogan. Thank you, thanks. Thank you so much. Um, oh, thanks to the Atlantic Council for having us. Um, again, I'm Kylie Atwood and this is Ambassador Derek Hogan, who is the perfect person for us to be talking to today. Um, you know, we just went through your resume there. You have extensive diplomatic experience. You just told me about 25 years at the State Department, which is just remarkable um, and so well positioned to be the person discussing the future of diplomacy and how you've seen it evolve personally during your time at the State Department. So I just kind of want to start out with some basic questions about the future of diplomacy, and then we can shift into the impact the Ukraine war has had, COVID, the China challenge. Um, but just first off, what do you see as the defining aspects of 21st diplomacy, 21st century diplomacy, excuse me, for the United States? And, and how have you seen diplomacy change in recent decades? Well, thank you. Thank you to the Atlantic Center. Thank you to uh, the Skrokoff Center uh, for pulling this together. Thank you to Dana Miner, uh, Dana Barnes. Of course, thank you to you, uh, um, Kylie, for, for, for uh, having this conversation with me. It's something we're excited about uh, at the State Department because we really have been in this process of uh, evaluating the trends that we've been seeing um, uh, in, in, in this century, the 21st century. I would say uh, two or three things come to mind when it comes to this distinguishing factors uh, in, uh, of diplomacy uh, in, in this time period. The first is what the Skrokoff paper actually puts out, which I fully agree with, uh, is the technology revolution. And I, I think we all have to come to grips with the fact that countries, powers, great powers, are, 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 are vying for these um, emerging technologies, AI, quantum, mm -hmm. advanced manufacturing, et cetera. And, and so the extent to which countries can harness these powers and, and, and leverage them to, uh, to advance uh, uh, their interest um, will really shape uh, where the world is, is moving. And I would say the United States, one of the things that makes us um, uh, unique in this respect is that we believe in the revitalization, revitalization of our alliances, of our partnerships, uh, both formal as well as informal, uh, not just to uh, bring dividends for Americans at home, but also to extend those uh, to all those uh, in, in the world, particularly with our partners and our allies. So, so first of all, uh, this technology revolution 
It will, I think, um, uh, shape how wars and conflicts are fought. We're going to talk about that in the Ukraine context in, in a moment. It will uh, shape how power, uh, how how, uh, how economies are powered. We just came out of COP 27, um, where 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 again we were talking about this energy transition, uh, and 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 so that's something that I think is is, is particularly important to uh, to take in mind, to keep in mind. We're going to be seeing how the emerging technologies is also really determining how uh, medical conditions are, are, are treated and, and, and thinking about uh, COVID um, and, and the extent to which we, were over, we have been able to overcome uh, of this pandemic through technology is, a, is, is particularly important. How democracies are deepened, um, are strengthened uh, through technology and how democratic movements, even in the most repressive societies, are actually advanced through uh, these, uh, uh, through this technological revolution. So I think that's one very important uh, uh, factor. Uh, a second distinguishing factor uh, is the rise of, of China. The United States uh, uh, national security strategy put forward um, by President Biden lays that out very clear, clearly that, uh, that the PRC, uh, People's Republic of, of China, is the one country uh, that potentially could compete with us across the uh, spectrum of, uh, of, of power. And, and so uh, dealing with that um, uh, in a very comprehensive, holistic way, not dealing with it alone, but actually dealing with it when it comes to uh, strengthening and revitalizing these alliances and, and partnerships that we have is something that we're very much of, of focused on. I also would say, uh, just to bring it uh, to the second piece of this uh, important discussion in terms of Russia, is when we think about how a P5 member, a permanent member uh, of the UN Security Council, also is looking to under, uh, undermine the rules-based order by launching a war of aggression, a war of conquest in the 21st century is something that, that I don't think is lost on the world at all. And, and so um, uh, using technology to try to advance of, of, of the of Putin regime's uh, ends is, is something uh, that I think we all need to be uh, cognizant of when it comes to um, you know, unleashed uh, disinformation campaign, um, uh, both in Ukraine but around the world particularly uh, in the global south, something that we've been dealing with uh, very um, assertively as, as well. So we, when we think about these trends, when we think about Russia, when we think about um, uh, China and, and the rise of China, we think about the, this, this global technology revolution, these are some of the things that we as a, as a, as a Department of State, but of course the U.S. government writ large, um, are, are tackling uh, head on and so look forward to talking about how we're doing that. Yeah, so, I mean, it seems to me like you mentioned three pillars there um, that are defining the future of diplomacy. You know, first you talked about harnessing technology, then, of course, the rise of China needing to deal with that, and then, um, you know, unexpected crises like the war in Ukraine. So how do you think that the United States needs to adapt its diplomacy to make sure that what it's doing diplomatically, you know, out there in the field, at embassies around the world here at Foggy Bottom to make sure that that diplomatic approach is actually effective. This is something that our Secretary of State, Secretary Blinken, has been seized with and, 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 and last year um, uh, rolled out his modernization ad agenda uh, for the State Department. That includes many um, uh, pillars. Uh, one is to build the expertise and capacity of the State Department to deal with these, um, uh, these emerging trends as well as challenges. And so uh, that means, for example, that we need to be recruiting uh, more tailored with these trends so and as well as training so that includes for example um, more diplomats uh, conversant in and able to advance our interest in multilateral diplomacy I want to speak to that in a moment uh, when it comes to emerging and disruptive technology uh, when uh, that's something that we've been uh, tailoring our, our training of diplomats for as well as uh, recruiting um, uh, for these um, uh, for these important uh, skills um, climate uh, change combating um, uh, climate 
uh, change, um, when it comes to um, economics, just being more conversant on, 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 these, on, on this important topic as well. And of course, as I mentioned before, uh, dealing with uh, China in a systemic uh, way. So, so that's one piece, uh, is, is that we are more equipped, uh, we are more able um, as, a, as an institution, as a diplomatic institution, both here in the State Department but overseas, uh, to be able um, uh, to, uh, to, to assertively engage in, in all of these areas. I think another important piece uh, that the Secretary has been pushing out is that the State Department itself uh, is equipped technologically to deal uh, yeah. with these uh, Im important challenges. And, and so uh, he has sought and, and, and secured for us a 50% increase in our IT budget. Mm -hmm. So we're now able to take advantage of, for example, uh, the services offered by data miners so that we can, for example, use AI uh, to, uh, to look through social media uh, and, and to see what is uh, around the corner, uh, to try to get ahead of that. Uh, to be able to tell uh, our story, to be able to counter um, uh, the serious uh, disinformation unleashed by the PRC as well as, as, as Russia. I think another important piece uh, that I mentioned earlier, but I, it's, it's really important um, underscoring, is our role in multilateral and international organizations. So this is something that I can't understate. Um, when it comes to uh, the, uh, the standards for the internet, when it comes to um, what is um, um, freedom of expression versus um, what is a, a suppression of, of freedom of expression and, and, and dealing with these really important issues. Uh, we have made a concerted effort to get ourselves back in the game. Mm -hmm. So for example, in the fall, uh, we successfully competed for the Secretary Generalship of the International Telecommunications Union, the, the body that pretty much determines the standards when it comes to um, uh, uh, internet and telecommunications. Uh, we were going against, uh, in that particular case, a, a Russian candidate. Could have imagined, could imagine if that Russian candidate would have won, what we'd be dealing with when it comes to standard setting. Um, a human Rights Council, getting ourselves back on the Human Rights uh, Council there. Really, really uh, working with our partners and allies in the UN General Assembly when it comes to taking important uh, resolutions, adopting important resolutions when it comes to condemning Russia's uh, actions uh, in Ukraine, most recently with 143 votes uh, in, in, in uh, in support of the resolution that, that condemns Russia's attempted annexation of, uh, of territories uh, in, in Ukraine. These are, these, are, these are just, I think, some important examples of how in the international um, arena, in these uh, international organizations and, and multilateral fora, uh, we are making our voice heard. Because if we're not, uh, then, then someone else is, or, or perhaps no one is. And, and neither of those conditions uh, really works uh, for the American people. I'm just curious, um, you know, the Secretary's speech on modernizing diplomacy was, was really interesting, um, and he's made some commitments that he's upheld, as you said. Um, I wonder if you have actually felt any of the changes that he has implemented mm -hmm. in your personal experience as a diplomat, you know, like doubling the budget for IT seems nice, but what does that mean for you at the department? Are you feeling that? And then just, if you wouldn't mind also speaking to um, the e efficacy and the usefulness of outside uh, resources like data miner that we were talking about in the green room that the State Department uses in their diplomatic security and in their operations center. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, how, how are those outside tools just as important as the internal commitments? No, I, I think that's an important question, and, and to, to be as specific as, as possible. Um, I think about the, uh, our efforts to counter what Russia has been trying to do uh, in Ukraine, uh, as an example. And the tools that we have uh, now at, at our disposal uh, to be able to, in this age where information is flying fast and furiously from all sorts of um, actors, both state as well as non-state actors, credible, not so credible uh, uh, information, where, where we are able, uh, because of the enhanced technology and the technological tools, 
the tools, but also the ability to quickly analyze, to process yeah. uh, 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 that information right. um, through our, our global engagement uh, center, for example, where we're able to get ahead of stories. We're able to get ahead of stories that where, for example, uh, we can say uh, we, we understand the Russians are planning to take X action, and they will use the following arguments. Mm. Those arguments are wrong for the following reasons, and we'll put out a fact sheet. Of course, this is well coordinated within the USG, State Department, National Security Council, Department of Defense, other actors uh, as appropriate. But we're able to get ahead of that. And then we're able to build an echo chamber um, through our incredibly real-time coordination with um, our partners and allies, both in Europe but outside of, of Europe as well. One of the things that I think Putin got wrong uh, with this war is that he thought it would uh, divide uh, the West, is that uh, he thought it, it, he could build um, you know, maximum support in, in parts of the world outside of the transatlantic community. But I think he's finding it increasingly difficult as he, per, as he prosecutes this heinous war. And, and, and so uh, through, our, uh, through technology, but I think we also cannot forget the importance of personal diplomacy, and this is where diplomats uh, really, you know, this is, uh, if you will, get paid for, for this, uh, is, is to have that people-to-people -people contact, right? right? And yeah. so um, we are organizing multilateral um, uh, and, and, and international conferences at the minister level, at the um, president uh, level, Summit of the Americas. Next, next week, I think it is, is the Africa Leaders Summit. We had a Pacific Island uh, uh, summit that the president uh, uh, hosted, where we're able to talk to people, able to have uh, um, uh, that direct uh, contact with people, building the confidence and the information that we are providing them. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I think a real credibility boost for us was when we uh, were able to share with the international community what Russia was planning to do prior to the February 24th um, in, invasion. Uh, that uh, that combined uh, with the people-to-people -people, uh, contact that we do both here in Washington, but as of course as well through our embassies, I think have 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 really made us uh, be able to uh, lead the charge when it comes to keeping Russia on the defensive uh, in the global uh, narrative. Um, I would say, uh, generally speaking, that we. Um, still, of course, have um, more transformation, more transformation to do. We are still in the process of hiring more people with those skill sets that I mentioned yeah. uh, uh, to you earlier. We may have to. How do you think de the department's doing on that? We did pretty good. I mean, with our, our, our last fiscal year uh, budget, we were able to hire 500 um, an additional um, foreign affairs uh, professionals for the State Department. Uh, uh, but that was like A1 class. That wasn't just, you know, for a specific. Um, uh, portfolio or something like that. Right. It, it's it's for um, um, generalists, uh, but 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 also combined with the uh, with the actual recruiting of the people that we're looking for. We're look, you know now we have a lot more discretion when it Got comes it. to the types of people, the skill sets that we want to bring into um, uh, the institution. On track for another five hundred uh, people to uh, uh, to bring in. And as I mentioned before, uh, with the 50% increase in our uh, IT um, a budget, now we are, we are seeing that the effects when it comes to having in real time the data analytics uh, to be able uh, uh, to make sense of what's happening in the world and to, mm -hmm. and to be able to build a policy around that. Yeah, so then in addition to the da da data analytics, mm -hmm. Um, one thing that struck me when I was thinking about this conversation is also the relationship between diplomacy and intelligence gathering mm. and how we've really seen that um, put on display leading up, in, leading up to the Ukraine war. Um, so I wonder if you could just touch on that a little bit. I mean, it, it strikes me that um, we're perhaps at a moment where diplomacy and intelligence gathering are as close as they have ever been when you have you know, the White House yeah. uh, routinely declassifying intelligence, you have the Secretary of State sharing our intelligence with allies to prove our point that we do believe that Russia is actually going to invade Ukraine. So could you just talk a little bit about that relationship and how you've seen that evolve? I mean, yeah. has it always been there, but we're just seeing it for the no. first time? You know, what's new yeah. here? Yeah, I, I, I think it, it's, 
to sound a little bit like a geek, it's one of the most exciting parts of, 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 of working in diplomacy today, um, is because of this closer nexus that we have now. We've always, in the past, um, erred on the side of protecting sources and methods, right, yeah. when it comes to intel um, a gathering. And, and that, of course, we need to preserve that. Uh, but uh, this administration in particular has, has really taken a hard look at uh, the benefits versus reward of sharing um, uh, information um, uh, ahead of, of, um, of events that we're expecting to happen mm -hmm. because it is so important to, I think, a cornerstone uh, of our foreign policy uh, these days. Uh, and, and that is uh, we work in partnership with our allies and our partners. Uh, and, 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 and I've seen it. I've seen it. I've been in the White House Situation Room where we're deciding, should we actually go ahead with this move, uh, whatever that move is, diplomatic, et cetera, economic move? And the answer is no. We first need to make sure we got our, our core allies, at a minimum, on the same page. If, and, and if we have to take a few more days to work out the issues there, then we're going to work, uh, work through those things. And, and, and so I think that's an important part. And then the other part of that is we're able to share with them what we know, mm -hmm. uh, and then we talk together about the best way for getting that out there. It may be, for example, that the US should not be the one leading uh, the charge when it comes to sharing that, uh, that downgraded intel. We may want to have another ally and, uh, or, or partner do that, but we coordinate that because again, it's all a part of our our, our broader strategy of achieving um, a Ukraine uh, that is whole, free, um, uh, economically viable. In the case of of um, of, uh, of Ukraine, and and so I think. Uh, that is what is what's happening now is is that we're able to uh, take the information um, see do a quick analysis interagency analysis of rewards versus cost in terms of sharing that information uh, seeing seeing how far we can go without again compromising uh, uh, sources and, and methods and then keeping the adversary uh, on, on 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 the back foot and and so uh, we've had a lot of success with that, I think, uh, and, and I think it, it also strengthens our credibility uh, with our allies and partners because we're calling it like we see it, and then, and then they see it happen. Um, in the case of Russia, moves that they've taken that we said that they were going to take. Uh, and then that, of course, then allows our allies and partners to come back to us and say, okay, we believe you. What else should we be doing in these uh, particular areas? So, so it's been uh, particularly um, um, uh, exciting to be in this time right now working because the process has, has changed uh, uh, so fundamentally for, to, to the good, I think. Yeah. Do you um, see that model being used, replicated um, in any other you know, diplomatic avenues that don't have to do with a war, but maybe just have to do with what the U.S. is strategically trying to achieve vis-a-vis -vis competition with China um, or some other topics. Do, do you think you can um, tap into our intelligence in that way routinely going forward? Yes. Um, two, two examples come to mind. One is cross-strait tensions between uh, PRC and, and, and Taiwan. Um, and, and I think uh, we took a similar uh, approach when it comes to uh, highlighting, spotlighting for the world what the PRC was intending uh, uh, to do when it comes to uh, ramped up uh, uh, activities against uh, a, a Taiwan. Mm -hmm. And that's number one. But I also see it in a variety of, of, um, of smaller, sort of more regional dynamics, at least in my part of the world and in and, 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 and Europe, when it comes to countries that we understand uh, through, our, and, and, um, through our relationships, through our embassies. Our embassy is not necessarily just intel. I mean, our embassies talk to a whole lot of people, a whole lot of actors, uh, not just a traditional government to government, but you know, civil society, academic academic uh, uh, institutions, uh, uh, think tanks, labor unions, 
everyone. Uh, and, and we're able to come up um, with an, sort of an analysis of, of what's happening. They make recommendations to us. We combine that uh, with whatever intel we have. And we'll go, first of all, privately uh, uh, to those governments and say, we understand what you're planning to do. We mm -hmm. think it's, let's coordinate if it's as simple as that, and if we think we want to um, be part of that action or, or at least steer it in a different direction, or that's not a good, that's not a good idea. That's mm -hmm. not a good idea for X, Y, or Z uh, reason. And, 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 and so we, we're able to use that information to shape the conversations that we have uh, uh, with our, our partners and allies. And when necessary, mm -hmm. it, it may go into the public realm. But, uh, but generally speaking, when it comes to partners and allies, we are very much uh, in the no surprises rule. We want to yeah. make sure we're on the same page. Um, just, you know, sticking with Ukraine, um, we've seen President Zelensky very openly um, talk about what his country is going through, what his country needs from the world, um, you know, what his red lines are. And he has, in some ways, you know, held the world accountable in a new way because he's just been so vocal about everything. And he's really tapped into social media, his daily addresses to the Ukrainian people, right. totally harnessing the backing of not just Ukrainians, as far as we can tell, um, but also, you know, of the West. Right. And, like, everyday Americans right. know who Zelensky is, which is, right. um, you know, pretty remarkable. So how do you think that uh, his, you know, leaning into public diplomacy, um, should make us think about the need to balance public diplomacy and quiet, private, behind-the-scenes diplomacy. Um, I think it's it's important uh, that we uh, that we all recognize we cannot stick our heads in the sand and just wish things wouldn't be spoken about. Right? Mm -hmm. I mean, the information is is going to get out, and and and. Uh, and for the most part, information should get out. I mean, that's what makes, I think, democracies uh, a, a strive. And I think that's one of the main contentions uh, uh, we have with authoritarian regimes in that they are actively trying to suppress uh, uh, information and using technology uh, uh, to do that. Uh, so, so I think uh, President Zelensky's approach is a shining example of what a real democratic country uh, with a real democratic uh, credentials and a democratic leader um, is, 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 is showing the world this is what technology uh, can do. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so uh, wh how that relates to us uh, is that we very much um, stay in, li in lockstep uh, with the Ukrainian government. Our, embassy uh, in, in, in Kyiv is um, on a daily basis in contact with the leadership of, of the government um, because we very much are invested uh, in this country's uh, uh, future, not just Ukraine, but, but what it means for the rules-based order. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so, uh, I mean, much of what uh, President Zelensky says, an independent thinker, uh, sovereign uh, uh, country, but much of what he said is not new to us yeah. because we are in so much... Uh, so there's uh, both uh, happening simultaneously. There's, there's both happening yeah. simultaneously. And, and I think that's important. You don't think one side is overpowered by the other at this point? No, no, I, I, I don't think so. I mean, I think we, uh, anything we do on Ukraine, as our, our president says, our secretary of state says, nothing about Ukraine without Ukraine. So we're not making any pronouncements without having first. We know uh, it well. Exactly. <laughs> right. Covering the State Department, yeah. <laughs> that is our mantra. Uh, yeah. But we try to live up to it. And, 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 and so certainly from our end, uh, that's the case, as, as well as uh, from the Ukrainians uh, and as, as well. But we do, we very much believe um, in, in a, an assertive uh, public diplomacy mm -hmm. uh, a campaign where we're in lockstep. And it's not just Ukrainian United States, but with uh, Ukrainian United States and G7 members or G7 Plus or the Quad or any of these others uh, of fora. Um, you know, President Zelensky in, in, in engaging African uh, leaders, uh, Latin American leaders. This is all for the good uh, because, again, we must not kid ourselves. Uh, Russia and the PRC invest a whole lot of resources in spinning a very different narrative. Yeah. Uh, so we have to work together on this front. And, you know, 
I, I, I kid, but it, it makes a lot of sense that there's nothing about Ukraine without Ukraine. Um, but the other thing that we hear a lot from the Secretary and the White House <clears throat> is that the United States doesn't see um, Russia being interested in serious diplomacy, but the only way to end this war is through a diplomatic outcome. So I don't think we could have you know, this conversation about the future of diplomacy without discussing Absolutely. that. Absolutely. And I just wonder, um, you know, from <clears throat> the perspective of creating a space for that diplomacy to happen, do you think that the administration is doing enough right now to create the forum and the connections for that diplomacy to happen should Russia actually decide that that's, you know, that they're ready for those mm -hmm. conversations? I think uh, the president and, and the administration at large, Secretary of State included, uh, have made it clear uh, that um, the conditions for peace, first of all, should be determined by the Ukrainians. Uh, we're, we're not going to get ahead of, of them. Um, but second of all, the Ukrainians have actually laid out uh, what those conditions yeah. are. Um, the same day that uh, President Zelensky uh, laid out his 10-point plan uh, for peace uh, at the G20 in Bali, that was the day that the Russians actually launched another massive uh, a missile campaign um, uh, against civilian infrastructure uh, in, in Ukraine. So I think that was Russia's or Putin's response to um, you know, the uh, an appetite uh, or his, our understanding of his uh, readiness for peace uh, there, that uh, not, not much. Yeah. Um, and, and I think the Ukrainians have, have, have made it clear uh, that uh, the conditions for peace just must be simply consistent with uh, the UN Charter principles, territorial integrity, sovereignty, respect for fundamental freedoms. Uh, and, 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 and so uh, that is what we are supporting. That's what we're getting um, um, behind. And, and it really is up to President Zelensky um, uh, to, to, you know, to determine that moment when, when it's right to sit down and, 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 and talk uh, with this Russian counter. But, but he's been pretty clear on that, too. I mean, he's, he's, he's made it clear. Um, uh, that uh, that as long as uh, Putin is doing what he is doing in the country, our president has also made it clear when uh, when uh, on the margins of the meeting or during the press conference uh, with uh, President Macron when he was here last week, all made it also uh, clear. Yeah, in, in theory, uh, ready for talks, but. Putin must show that he's actually ready to uh, uh, to chart a diplomatic uh, exit, and and I think what's also been uh, consistent in our message is that that is consistent with uh, uh, the UN Charter principles, and 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 so um, I think we're doing what we can uh, to create uh, the space for this um, um, uh, for this uh, for these diplomatic talks, but I think we also need to uh, realize um, uh, that. Uh, Russia is showing absolutely zero interest uh, in, 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 in talks that would lead to and preserve Ukraine's viability uh, as a state, uh, as a democracy, as a sovereign country. Just given your expertise in the region, you know, you've spent time in Russia, mm -hmm. um, Azerbaijan, you were the ambassador to Moldova from 2018 through last summer, I mean, mm -hmm. the summer of 2021. What do you think are Russia's goals for the region? I think Russia, well, I think Putin has made it uh, uh, clear that he um, is looking to reassert uh, his and, and Russia's influence um, uh, uh, in the region. Um, he has made it clear uh, that a country like Ukraine uh, simply uh, shouldn't exist uh, as it does, um, and and I've seen it uh, up close and personal uh, when it comes to uh, countries uh, in the region that are being forced to choose between um, you know going east versus west uh, when when a country, for example, um, you know the country of Moldova, uh, country. Of, truly respect for, for the democratic uh, progress that it has made over the last um, uh, a few years. It says it wants to have um, pragmatic relations with all um, of its neighbors. I mean, there's an economic relationship there uh, um, uh, with, with 
with Russia and other countries in the East, but it's also making it clear that it sees its future in the transatlantic community, mm -hmm. right? It sees its future in the European Union. We're delighted that the European Union granted candidate status uh, uh, to, uh, to Ukraine uh, and, and Moldova. And, and, and so um, having to see a country like that have to make difficult choices every day Right when 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 a country like Russia is using uh, its its gas leverage, when a country like Russia is using its economic leverage, when it comes to these uh, a countries, um, you know, a, a traditional uh, economic ties and being forced to now pivot west, it actually it's for the long term. It's good. I mean, you know, when we've seen this. Uh, incredible uh, decoupling of, 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 of Russia, particularly in the energy sector, not just in countries like Moldova and others, uh, uh, although Moldova still very much is reliant, but we're seeing how, how Moldova now is buying gas um, on, on, on the spot market, you know, buying gas um, uh, from, uh, from the European Union, connecting uh, an end to the electricity grid uh, of the European Union. And other countries uh, in, in Europe, we see this incredible price cap, this oil price cap uh, uh, that was put in place um, um, of just yesterday uh, that is now tied up, married up with the EU's uh, eighth sanctions package. These are, I think, exclamation points uh, about what countries uh, are, are saying when it comes to relying on a country that is weaponizing the very resources uh, it, it has. Mm -hmm. um, you know, given given those goals for Russia, right, and given the fact that the U.S. believes there needs to be a diplomatic solution. Just one more question on Ukraine, yeah, sure. and then we can sort of pivot. But um, Blinken warned last night of Russia potentially seeking phony diplomacy, um, and he, he said that they could do that essentially because Ukraine has been, you know, so effective, so resilient, and mm -hmm. Russia may, you know, uh, dangle out some diplomatic... Um, efforts, but then just use it to what he said was rest, refit, regroup, and reattack. So, how do U.S. diplomats know if Russia is coming to the table? You know, down the line, we don't know how long that's going to take. But how how do you guys know? Like, what kind of training do you have your time spent in Russia to know if they're coming to the table? seriously or if they're coming um, just as sort of a head fake, if you will? It's a great question. Um, I, I, I think it really comes down uh, to our understanding and we used a variety of tools at our disposal to be able to really sort of crystallize that understanding, including uh, active and serious consultations with our partners and allies, um, not just in Europe but around the world, to understand um, what, what Russia may be um, um, uh, up to, is when it comes to the terms uh, that they uh, would be prepared to uh, discuss when it comes for peace. Um, if it's basically, um, you know, something like hold in place, right? We're just going to just have, quote unquote, ceasefire uh, and, and, and really nothing beyond that. Um, that is a red herring. I mean, and that I think is what the secretary was uh, referring yeah. to, um, where um, you know we've been down that road with Crimea, 2014, 2015. Just you know, just hold in place. Let's get some Minsk uh, process going, mm -hmm. uh, and we saw what the Minsk process was able to achieve again because Russia's yeah. fundamental interest um, uh, were not being achieved through that process. And so um, I, I think until we see Russia speaking to Ukraine. They don't need to speak to us. I mean, they, they, they invaded uh, Ukraine. Russia speaking to uh, Ukraine on, on terms that are more or less consistent with what Zelensky has been laying out when it comes to uh, some conditions for peace, uh, uh, then, then that is, uh, that is uh, an indication. But again, I need to stress nothing like that we've seen so far. Yeah. I just do want to talk about China briefly. I know. Um, you focus most of your time on yeah. Europe, but yeah. you can't ignore no, not, China. Yeah. Um, and so, given how long you've been in the Foreign Service, I just wonder if you could speak a little bit about how the U.S. diplomatic approach to China has evolved in recent decades, mm -hmm. um, and if you think the current approach of trying to work with China in spaces where we have overlapping interests mm -hmm. and trying to compete with China where we need to confront them, where we need to. If, 
if you think that approach is working, and if so, why? Yeah, I, I mean, I've seen um, over the past couple of decades uh, sort of an evolution where we were thinking, well, you know, we just need to give China more time. We need right. to uh, see what the benefits of China's uh, accession to the WTO um, would bring. And, and if they just understood, you know, and just saw the value of uh, being part of this uh, community mm -hmm. of, uh, of, of nations, market-based, democratically uh, aligned nations, then over time we would see some um, positive movement. And unfortunately, we haven't seen that. You know, we saw what they did in Xinjiang, um, um, how they're handling um, on, on, on Taiwan and the relationship uh, uh, there, their quote unquote no limits partnership with Russia, um, another country that, as I mentioned before, is actively undermining the rules based uh, order. Um, that, that approach, I mean, uh, what we see from China, what we hear uh, from China privately as well as uh, publicly, makes it clear to us uh, that. Yes, we have to um, uh, uh, lay out our terms uh, for for relationship that is actually based on good, not for the American people, but also uh, uh, for the international community writ large. So that means preserving the economic trade relationship. I mean, it's it's an incredibly large um, uh, relationship. I mean, five to six hundred billion dollars in in in, in trade. Um, you know, the imports that we get from China, um, the, the market uh, that China presents uh, for American companies, super important. But we want that to be based on a level playing field where, where, uh, where, where U.S. Uh, companies are, are able to operate in China without fear of um, technology being stolen or forced to being transferred um, uh, uh, to them uh, as just one a example. So um, as, a, as a diplomat, uh, we, and I will focus on, on Europe, uh, the, the space I know and love most, um, we see what China is, is doing in, in, in Europe. And you know, so, uh, sometimes we hear the argument, well, you know, why, um, you know, why, you know, why shouldn't we just focus exclusively on, on, on Russia, the quote unquote near and present danger? Um, but we, but for some of the reasons I, I'm, I mentioned uh, earlier, we ignore China to our peril, but also it's what China is doing uh, in, in Europe when it comes to the debt financing, when it comes to, um, you, know, you know, setting up um, 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 you know, political dialogue uh, that in such a way tries to steer countries away from um, democratically based um, um, stances on you know, a human rights resolution just because of the strong economic relationship. I mean, one example is uh, Lithuania. Well, Lithuania was doing like every other country, uh, many countries are doing when it comes to calling out China's uh, uh, human rights um, ab abuses in Xinjiang uh, uh, in Taiwan. Uh, well, China just cranked up the economic pressure uh, on, on, on Lithuania. And, and so there, we worked very closely uh, with the European Union uh, including through what just what just concluded our, our third session yesterday, the US EU Trade and Technology Council that our Secretary of State along with um, Secretary of, of, of Commerce and our, our US Trade Representative uh, uh, co-hosted where we're able to, to, to coordinate when it comes to pushing back on, China, on, on China's uh, uh, coercive uh, economic uh, actions and, 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 um, and, and coming up uh, and, and supporting the EU's 5G toolbox to, to, to remove untrusted vendors uh, from, um, from European uh, markets. It's just, just another ex example. So, so we are seized uh, uh, with this issue and with the resources that we're getting, as I mentioned, as part of the modernization agenda, we're going to be able to do this even more. So I want to, we only have about 10 more minutes, so okay. I just, I do want to uh, turn to some questions sure. from folks who are watching. Um, and <clears throat> one of them is about China. So um, this person asks, could you please speak to the projective outlook for an emerging global bipolarity between the US and China and the application of soft power in Asia to counter PRC violations of of perceived international norms. Yeah, I think um, I'm just sharing my personal view. I, I I think we're moving, at least the U.S. And, and what I see we're doing right now, moving away from the idea of, you know, 
bipolar, unipolar, these sort of poles in general, and, and, and focusing more on, on, on two, tri two, two major challenges in this 21st century. One is um, harnessing all the, technolog uh, the, the technological um, um, advancements uh, for the American uh, people, so you know, building up uh, critical uh, um, uh, supplies, uh, supply chain, um, you know, digital connectivity. All these things are moving really uh, aggressively on the the uh, the the President's Inflation Reduction uh, Act, the Chips Act, and Science Act. These are all e examples of our uh, um, of uh, of our approach to this. And at the same time, working with our partners and allies around the world um, uh, to to put in place standards so that this technological revolution is yeah. consistent with our values, right? Uh, and and not letting um, off authoritarian regimes hijack and, uh, this. And so, um, and, and that way, and, and seeing how we are approaching a range of, of, of global challenges from Ukraine uh, to, uh, uh, to climate change, um, I don't see so much bipolarity. I, I, I see much more uh, the United States, uh, together with our partners and allies, around the world, in Europe and, and beyond, uh, tackling uh, global challenges as well as authoritarian regimes. But do you think that the State Department and U.S. diplomats are putting enough energy into the soft power um, to counter China's rise right now, given the other focal points of U.S. foreign policy right now, You know, given the focus on the Ukraine war? And if you could... Uh, answer that one quickly, so then I can get an, another <laughs> sure. audience question. Uh, the short answer is <laughs> we can the, always do more. We yeah. can always do more. Uh -huh. um, and and you know, and our um, our our budget, uh, you know, our, our budget planning is, is such that we are trying to do uh, more each year. But I would, uh, but I'm proud of what we have accomplished when it comes to a soft power. Like I said, what we just discussed at the beginning, we are taking advantage of, of resources provided by um, um, great American companies, uh, including the ones that are uh, uh, sponsoring this event, uh, to be able to uh, to be able to promote and preserve a rules-based order, yeah. and uh, and and to be able to make sure uh, that countries know um, uh, the the positive value of technology. Yes, a country like PRC or Russia can use, or, or Iran, um, uh, can use technology to ramp up surveillance, um, you know, f uh, facial recognition programs to really, really sort of, you know, try to uh, um, um, uh, tamp down dissent. Um, um, but, you know, one, we're countering that, but two, there are also technology um, uh, that's available to, at the same time, increase privacy, but do it in such a way that it aligns with our values. And so that is also what we used at TTC, this USNEU Trade and Technology Council. That's one of the liberals coming, of, uh, coming out of that, to make sure uh, that the US and the EU are thinking about this along the same lines. A perfect transition, because another audience member asked, what are the Excuse me. What are the potential risks of using AI technology in the State Department, and how are these risks minimized? Are you watching those decisions happen in real time right now? You know, we, we should use this technology, but we have to be careful about this one. And I'm not just talking about you know Huawei, which is you know some of the bigger companies, but some of the smaller platforms. You know that you choose to use U.S. companies or not. Yeah, I, I mean we we. One guiding light is, uh, to the extent possible, the removal of untrusted vendors from, um, yeah. you know, from telecommunications uh, uh, infrastructure. And and another um, uh, uh, guiding light is that we work now and we work fast and hard with our allies and partners to set the standards for AI, for quantum for advanced manufacturing so that it is done in a way that actually strengthens um, a democracy. And that is, again, one of the uh, key deliverables coming out of this uh, third session of the Trade and Technology Council. Yeah, do you, do you see realistically there being global standards set for AI anytime soon? It's hard to, to say. I, I, mean, I, I mean, I think, first of all, we have got to build a coalition 
um, yeah. uh, for that. Um, and, and, and again, that's why um, uh, you know, starting uh, with another uh, global actor, the EU, that is, that is similarly vested in this uh, makes a lot of sense to me. And, and so we are, are doing that. We have similar formats uh, uh, in the Indo-Pacific uh, and, 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 and Latin America, uh, where, where again, we are um, deepening and strengthening our our collaboration, our consultation, mm -hmm. where we're talking about ways that we can improve information sharing so that we can come up with the right approach. And then, for example, what I said, when we uh, successfully won the uh, ITU Secretary uh, a General um, a position, a global body uh, that is looking uh, at, at this uh, issue as well, we hope to, through these international fora, move things in the right direction. It's going to be hard, but, yeah. um, but I think we're on the right path. So this will be the final question, um, and it's also from the audience. One of the State Department key tenants in its 2022 to 2026 is data-informed diplomacy. What does that mean for the political officer corps, and what is the gap in data that currently exists? So we're thinking about this right now in our bureau, the European and Eurasian uh, Affairs Bureau, where we are uh, hiring people uh, in our bureau, and we've got uh, positions around um, and, and certain posts around the world uh, that are looking at specifically data analytics, what we can do there. Um, one of the things that I think we have struggled with uh, is, is how do we understand trend lines moving um, across Europe in my world, but uh, you know, um, it, it can also be taken to the global level as well. Um, and and you know, how do we understand what's happening uh, in, in, in real time? So the use of technology to provide the real time an analysis is, is also important, but we need to marry uh, uh, that uh, with our diplomats uh, on the ground mm -hmm. uh, to see what's actually happening yeah. uh, and, and to be able to sort of in, in, in interpret um, you know, what's said and not said um, by you know, uh, stakeholders uh, uh, in a particular uh, a, a country. And so, so how long will it take you guys to take stock of, of you know, where that gap exists, do you think? It's something that I think we um, are, uh, are looking at actively now. I don't, I don't have a particular timeline uh, for you. I mean, I will say that uh, with the development, the creation of our bureau that just got started, our, our cyberspace and digital policy um, uh, bureau, uh, we are able, you know, we're putting resources right now where they are coordinating uh, department-wide uh, what are some of the gaps. And so mm -hmm. I, I'd like to be able to put a rain check on that and, and, and come back sure. to you in terms of a timeline. Sure. But, I, but I will say that, that the inputs are in place to be able to come up with some answers. So. Great. Okay. Awesome. Um, well, thank you so much, you. Ambassador. It's really an enlightening conversation and one that, you know, we and media and U.S. diplomats and think tanks here will continue to have. So we appreciate it. And thank you, everyone online, for joining us. Thanks to the Atlantic Council and the Scrocoff Center. Look forward to future conversations.